Hello, everyone. Welcome to our sixth annual and first virtual Rare Disease Day. Thank you for joining us all. And uh, remember that last year, Rare Disease Day was one of the last in-person events that we had. And so I'm glad we have the technology and uh, support and tenacity to do this together, but apart this year again. The annual event is a remarkable example of what patients, families, physicians, researchers, advocates, the communities that make land-grant universities such as ours meaningful, have created to bring attention and resources to diseases that might otherwise be neglected, sort of forgotten. And everybody who has taken care of patients with rare diseases, such as my bone marrow transplant practice knows that although the diseases themselves epidemiologically may be rare, having a quote unquote rare disease is not rare at all. By coming together here today and other days, we are putting together the such an important ability to, to learn from nature, learn from data, learn from our scientific observations and push that knowledge for all it's worth. Because again, if we bring it to the patients, that's what makes it meaningful. So thank you for being impossible to discourage uh, despite all the things that are happening with, uh, uh, with 2020, with uh, discouragements perhaps, you know, with dissipation of some of the energy that happens with a pandemic of the magnitude we have just experienced and um, know that the University of Minnesota has long been committed to helping patients with rare diseases and to championing research that opens the new venues how to treat them. Because if the standard of care is, is nothing or just being nice, uh, that's not enough. We are really much better positioned to, uh, to take the humility we feel in front of the human disease of grave magnitude, but also the endurance that comes from the continuum from basic science to clinical science. And the most important thing, which is a compassionate will to bring this to the patients we serve. So today I have the honor and privilege to introduce University President John Gable to welcome you and reaffirm that commitment. Hello, I'm Joan Gable, President of the University of Minnesota. And I wanna thank the University of Minnesota Medical School, the College of Pharmacy, the Center for Orphan Drug Research and the Stem Cell Institute for sponsoring this very important event. As many of you know, there are more than 7,000 known rare diseases that collectively impact and affect more than 30 million people in the United States alone. Many families across Minnesota deal with these realities all day, every day. There are approximately 50,000 people in Minnesota that have a rare disease and more than half of them are children. So it's very important that we at the University of Minnesota commit to being a world leader in improving the care of those with rare disorders. Students, faculty, and staff across the university are actively engaged in patient care, research, and community engagement related to rare diseases and their therapies. Our medical school leads the way, gaining reputation for treating some of the most challenging cases that are often turned away by other providers. And further adding to their ability to provide the best possible care, they've really been leaning into telehealth, which has been greatly expanded for patients with rare disorders and their families so that they can see their specialist while remaining at home. For example, M Health Fairview has seen more than 1 million patients via telehealth or done 1 million virtual visits in just the last year. I'm also really pleased to note that our faculty physicians, as a result of this effort, are some of the most experienced in dealing with devastating rare diseases. And our College of Pharmacy and its Center for Orphan Drug Research have been improving the care of individuals suffering from rare diseases by relying on research, education, and public policy dating all the way back to 2005. So as Aristotle once said, hope is the waking dream. And on behalf of a grateful university, your partner, we're really grateful to you and thank you for providing hope to so many 
and for all of the work that you're doing and the commitment you've made to patients, families, and communities across our state and beyond. Thank you. Well, thank you, President Gable. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sue Berry. Uh, Dr. Berry is an esteemed colleague of mine and, and professor of genetics and metabolism, and she is what in baseball would be called a triple threat of practicing physician, dedicated researcher, and advocate for the patient. In particular, she has been very active and very significant uh, leader in the newborn screening and uh, of many disorders that she has taken upon the X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, which is one of the disorders that Dr. Orchard and myself and others are treating in, um, in uh, the bone marrow transplant ward. Uh, and uh, she's been instrumental in following up the analysis of the data to establish a value and important of this kind of testing, because that is exactly why the university is so important, because we don't just say, oh, this may be good, because good intentions are not enough. We really need to provide the evidence so that we can build the capacity around this and, and be the, uh, the, the public intellectuals that the, uh, that the state and the communities we serve expect us to be. Today, she's going to speak on the impact of telemedicine from her professional experience. And uh, as you heard from President Gable, uh, the telehealth has expanded exponentially due to COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, since uh, my team and team of James Hereford have put the M Health Fairview on the map some, uh, some three or four years ago, I am almost disproportionately proud of the accomplishments of our faculty, staff, and students in being able to uh, deploy the virtual switch to our clinics uh, almost in, you know, like three days or something, you know, we are talking three years about doing this. And then, then this small uh, Roomba of a virus comes along and we do it in three days. Um, many patients like that. And so it's exciting that Dr. Berries has her own perspective on uh, the other side of the screen uh, and uh, will we'll share it with us. I have been asked to add that there will be a short time for question and answer at the end of each of the presentations, and there's going to be additional block uh, at the end of this event. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for everything you do. And uh, welcome, Dr. Baer. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective about the successes and the shortcomings of telehealth, um, particularly with regard to rare diseases. And I'm saying this in the context of being a person who, um, for my entire career, has been involved in the care of persons with rare diseases. And this is a unique um, experience. So I put this in because I think it's helpful for you to know that this is true. But I'll move on. And what I'm going to do is tell a sort of a tale of two times. And I'm going to talk about why telehealth has always been important. But I'm going to tell you what it turned into overnight, as Jacob described. So before March 2020, this was we loved the idea of telehealth. And what it was going to be was a way to improve access in my own field of genetics, um, there's a tremendous workforce shortage and this was contemplated as a means by which we could um, be able to stretch the genetics availability um, to improve access. The problems with telehealth before March 2020 were that it had some really grave limitations. First of all, you have to be licensed in the state where you deliver care. And so if I wanted to do a telemedicine visit with somebody in North Dakota, I'm not licensed in North Dakota. Um, in, insurance companies would not necessarily acknowledge that the care that could be received through telehealth was equivalent to, or in some cases, I'm going to say, honestly, better than it could be um, if you did a face-to-face -face visit. So there were no financial incentives to do telehealth of any meaningful nature. Um, there were rules about where the care could be delivered and where it had to be sent from, where, who was the originator and where was the site. And it had to be done from a clinic to a clinic using, and using special equipment. 
There were privacy issues um, and strict limitations on what platforms could be used to do telehealth, um, which while respectful were limiting. The other thing was that people just didn't know how to do it. And everybody was nervous about sitting in front of the camera and didn't know if they'd be able to do that kind of care. So there were some significant limitations. And honestly, telehealth had not penetrated very far before March, 2020. So to be able to make that happen, to try and do more with telehealth before that, the potential impact for providing care was really well known and with access to care as the primary driver. And for us in genetics, there was a tremendous focus on developing telegenetic services um, that was driven by our limited workforce and was strongly encouraged by HRSA. And so what is HRSA? HRSA is the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is an agency of the US Department of Health and Human Services. And it's really the people who try and make sure things are available to United States citizens for healthcare. So it's the primary federal agency that impro to, for improving healthcare to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable. Um, I would argue that persons with rare diseases can fit into all three of those elements. So why was telehealth an ad adhersa activity? Well, telehealth, which is the use of electronic information, telecommunications technologies for long distance clinical healthcare, um, patient education, public health and health administration. It was to provide access to care primarily to remote areas. And a lot of the focus was on trying to provide telemedicine to rural locations. So HRSA actually had previously developed and were long established with telehealth resource centers. There are 12 national, I mean, 12 regional and two, 12, and two national centers that were committed to implementing telehealth programs. And here I'm going to mention rural and underserved communities. And so the, their priorities were, again, to extend essentially geographic limit, you know, to extend across geographic limitations. So concomitant to that, at the same time, HRSA also has a responsibility for another aspect of support for rare conditions, and that is for genetic services. So in parallel to, but not exactly overlapping, their regions for telehealth services, HRSA also has regional genetics networks. I'm very proud to be part of the Midwest Genetics Network, so-called Region 4, and the focus of the regional genetics networks mirrors that of HRSA, which is to serve the underserved. And for genetic services, that's just about everybody, it turns out. But particularly, geographic and other limitations prevent services um, for genetics um, treatment or uh, assessment. And if you think about it, virtually all genetic disorders are rare disorders. So this is why we, the geneticists, have been so fond of and so enamored of as anything that promotes care for rare diseases. So HRSA had long been trying to facilitate implementation of telehealth, primarily to increase health for genetic, for to increase access for genetic services as well. Uh, so the tale of two times, I'm coming back to it. So right after March 22, in fact, you can probably put a single date on the calendar, March 14th, perhaps, or something like that, uh, there was an immediate need for telehealth that went away on beyond being nice to people in rural areas and trying to provide care for rare diseases. Um, there were immediate needs beyond the personal protective uh, devices. We needed to be able to assess and plan for risks. And the general sense was that we needed to have ways to provide medical care that would reduce risk allow access to families and to, um, to care providers. We really, really needed to have a new wave and the way to do that turned out to be telehealth. So what happened to telehealth? Well, immediately, virtually immediately, and as Jay Gild alluded to, there was an immediate, virtually unplanned change to provision of healthcare as a virtual role. We are indeed fortunate in the Fairview system that some forward planning had been taking place that allowed this to be essentially dropped on a dime, but um, it was a really um, immediate and sort of quasi-terrifying, exciting um, experience. Of course, 
by its very nature, this included care for rare diseases. And we in our clinical area um, in pediatrics who care for a lot of children with rare diseases, um, relatively quickly adapted almost all of our care provision to virtual services. Now there were immediate needs for changes in the rules. It had to happen right away. Um, the, the original plans for telehealth and the way that they were held um, regulatorily set up was that they would be going clinic to clinic. And that obviously was not going to work. We stopped going into clinic to provide services and immediately began providing services to individuals in their homes. So that had to be allowed. There had to be a rule that made that okay. We also had to be able to provide services to anybody that we cared for and virtually immediately, most of the states um, adopted emergency measures that would allow um, providers to um, practice in their state without formal licensure. And this remains um, a fluid condition even today. Reimbursement had to be established, and honestly, we didn't care about that at the first moment. We just wanted to find ways to provide care to families, but it really is um, absolutely necessary in the business of medicine that people who provide service re can receive reimbursement for the for the care and that families will have that paid for by insurance so we had to have some immediate responses it was important for example that very early in this uh, the centers for medicaid services cms quickly changed what they would they would allow payment for in terms of medical services to include uh, telemedicine services. And that assisted, I think, other insurers to follow. So early in our telehealth transition, any platform was okay as long as it wasn't live. They would overtly have to say, and I don't understand why that would be, do not do Facebook Live or TikTok for your medical visits. But what that really meant was that there were relaxations of um, HIPAA expectations. Um, HIPAA, the health, uh, the the, the act that helps provide and ensure privacy for patients, <coughs> excuse me, um, needed to have some relaxation to allow other platforms. And initially that meant people started using Zoom. Um, they used FaceTime, they used Microsoft Teams, virtually any uh, sort of uh, platform that was available. Um, re very rapidly, and I was really uh, proud of how quickly we were able to accomplish this in, in our care system. This was changed to secure systems that were integrated into electronic health records. And um, so that, that was a really remarkable, um, rapid transition to uh, highly secure private um, platforms that were based on need for telehealth. There had to be rapidly emergency authorization concerning provision of care across our state lines. And as I mentioned, um, states very rapidly um, promoted emergency orders that allowed this kind of medical care to cross state lines. And CMS changed the rules about expectation for location of care. So to give you a sense of how this was impacting and felt by persons with rare disease, I drew upon some of the information from the National Organization for Rare Diseases, NORD. And so they, they did a series of virtual discussion groups covering people from all over the country, more than 800 respondents. And it turned out that in, soon into the pandemic, uh, at the time that they were doing this, more than 83% of individuals had been offered telehealth visits by their health provider. And almost all, 88% accepted. 92% of persons who had a telehealth visit regarded it as a positive experience. And this was very important to me as a provider in uh, providing care for persons with rare diseases is that the population who is really limited in being able to access quality health care had a way to make accomplish that during the pandemic. So I'm very, um, mindful of how much impact telemedicine has had during the pandemic. So what happened to rare disease care? Well, since the, began, the pandemic began, telehealth has become the primary delivery system for care. 
That means, of course, there are no more 10-hour drives to clinic for your one-hour visit. And that wasn't why we did it, but it sure turned out to be important. Um, we, in our practice and others too, have used photography as an examination tool as well. Um, we request that families um, send photographs that will help us assist in our medical examination. I will mention, however, of course, there, there's no real substitute for certain kinds of exam elements. And so even during the pandemic, person-to-person -person care um, in face-to-face -to -face needed to continue in certain ways. So are there really any silver linings in a pandemic? And honestly, I think I'd have to say yes. First, there was turned out to be quite a bit of savings of time for both us and for families in terms of being able to accomplish visits. So we were somewhat more efficient. My biggest surprise, and I should have thought of it, but it, it should have been obvious, but this is so much less burdensome for families with complex medical needs. One of my favorite little people that I followed for a while, I don't get to see or didn't get to see very often because to be able to come to clinic and to have two nurses and a special van to carry his ventilator and um, to bring his family. And it was really, really hard for him to come to clinic. So we didn't see him very often. Now, I can not only see him, but I see him in his own environment. I see how he is when he's at his best and how he feels um, most comfortable. And that has itself been a tremendous benefit to us as providers, which is to have a much better and clearer view of the child in their own environment and the family um, with them. The, ch the kids are so much more, um, they're in their own house. They are more comfortable. I also had not appreciated, but I'm very grateful for the new strategies for education that this has provided. Um, it allows me in some ways to be able to be a better observer and trainer of people um, who are undergoing medical education because it's a little less intimidating to sit in on a virtual visit than it is for me to hang over the shoulder of a person uh, trying to conduct a clinical visit um, with me standing there um, not truly try to judge them, but they might feel that way. So I really like virtual um, visits as a great way to facilitate medical education as well. So what's the big issue? As the pandemic wanes, what's gonna happen to telehealth? What about all our emergency changes? What's gonna happen to licensure and technology rules and reimbursement? So it's an 800 pound gorilla is sitting in around. I'm grateful that this is something that we have to trample gap to tackle because I'm happy for the pandemic to wane. But I think what I would say is we need to have some, some answers about this. We need to have discussion about bandwidth. Currently there are unequal access to an essential service and this was truly one of the limitations of telehealth during the pandemic. Licensure as we're not in an emergency situation is gonna have to be addressed because we want to have people appropriately licensed to provide care, but I'm not sure that a state border is the way to determine whether one person is, should be licensed or not. And we need to continue thinking and to encouraging reimbursement parity. Providers have to be compensated reasonably for the work they provide. Now, this is gonna require the interactions of a lot of people, federal agents, state boards of practice, payers, providers, education systems, patients and families, legislators, others, everyone's going to have to participate in that conversation. So what is happening right now? Well, there are quite um, active discussions about broadband access and telehealth. Broadband is more than just telehealth. It's also all the educational bandwidth that was uh, needed and may still be needed even um, as the pandemic wanes. We will still, I think, have need for that. There's gonna require changes in regulatory actions and in legislative plannings on both the federal and state level. I'm gonna mention as a parenthetical that today and on Monday, the Minnesota state legislators, legislatures actually having um, talks about a bill regarding telehealth, that's House File 1412 and Senate File 1160 being discussed in the Commerce Committees today and Monday. So. Um, those of you who are politically active can step right in and start expressing your desire to support telehealth for um, Minnesotans, uh, particularly those with rare diseases. 
So the Nord also developed some principles that I think are very valuable for uh, people with rare diseases, and that is that all patients should have equal and effective access to tele telehealth services. Patients and their providers should be able to make a choice on the location and type of care they receive based on what's in the best interests of the patient and parenthetically, not necessarily the insurer or the provider. It should be what's best for the patient. There should be transparency about privacy protections and cost sharing must be established and preserved. And this should be driven by data. And I'm so hopeful that as the pandemic moves forward and ends, that we'll have really valuable and useful data that's established about telehealth. So what could happen? Well, I'm hoping patients can be seen either at home or in person. The provider may not need to be anywhere close to the patient. I'm thinking, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about how new things are going to come up, um, artificial intelligence, wearables, others that support um, healthcare. Broadband is gonna be a big piece. Of, and what we're going to do, I hope, is to improve care for those who are underserved. So what I would say is that we're not gonna do this. This is not gonna happen. We're not gonna be able to put the elephant back in the barn. The, the door is too small. And so I'm very hopeful that we'll have the opportunity to expand and use telehealth as a critical tool in the management and care for persons with rare diseases. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Berry. Uh, I'm Jim Cloyd. I'm the uh, director for the Center for Orphan Drug Research uh, at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I join uh, President Gable and uh, uh, Vice President Tolar in uh, welcoming you to this program. And I'm uh, about to start our next introduction as I pull up my introductory slides. Uh, I do want to make one minor correction uh, from Dr. Tolar's uh, comments. We're going to hold all questions until the panel session. Uh, as you heard from uh, Dr. Barry and her thoughtful and insightful consideration of some of the clinical considerations, uh, uh, clinical practice is supported not only by personnel and resources, but also by uh, policy and regulation. And this was addressed in part by Dr. Barry, but now we are fortunate to have Bobby Patrick, who is a lawyer and the Vice President of Strategic Growth and Policy for the Minnesota Medical Alley Association, consider some of these policy and regulatory issues, particularly as we go forward. Indeed, uh, we won't be putting the elephant back in the barn. We need to build a new barn. So uh, his background uh, amply serves him for this uh, challenge as he is now uh, as a part of Medical Alley considering these issues and prior to that was uh, a participant in the Minnesota State Legislature where he uh, aided the speaker and the minority leader in considerations of these topics. Uh, Bobby, welcome. Thank Actually, you. Let me, let, me, let me finish up. I realize I uh, didn't complete the, the thought here, uh, technology being a challenge. Uh, after uh, Bobby's presentation, we'll go on to have a panel session, which will be led by Dr. Orchard, who will serve uh, as the moderator. And uh, he is a professor of pediatrics and the medical director of the Inherited Metabolic and Storage Disease Program here at the university. He is a internationally known expert in the treatment of uh, rare inherited metabolic disorders. And lastly, I'm reminded to tell you how you can place your questions through Whova by following the guidance on the screen. And with that, Bobby, now I uh, welcome you to the lecture. Great, thanks, Jim, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. All right. Great, well, again, thank you, uh, Bobby Patrick. I, I am proud uh, to be here from the Medical Alley Association to talk about uh, the future of telehealth policy after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so I will start. There's an old maxim in policymaking, uh, though it's largely applicable across pretty much any profession, that rarely does anything get accomplished until your back is against the wall. 
The strategy then, of course, is to find the most efficient and effective way to put those opposite of you in said position while staying out of it yourself. Typically, this is done via a number of strategies, such as feet dragging, countless hearings, or bare knuckled grassroots work. Though ultimately, which strategy you choose depends on whether time is your ally or enemy. For most of the last decade, particularly in policymaking circles, time was the ally of those who, while they supported the use of telehealth, weren't quite sure about its potential for adoption and use. Let's call them lukewarmists. Telehealth was approached, even by many who extolled its virtues, as something that can suffice only when in-person care was impracticable, whether that was due to geography, physical challenges, or some other circumstance, or only as an add-on, something that supplemented in-person care. It was not, generally speaking, thought of as a primary modality for delivering healthcare services. As the calendar turned to 2020, however, the healthcare industry was continuing to move the other way. Telehealth companies were growing, brick and mortar providers were investing in remote care functionality, remote monitoring was beginning to take hold, and digital care delivery as a concept was one of the most sought after investment opportunities in healthcare. Related policies, however, affecting telehealth remain the same. Despite these growing signs of life for adoption by patients and providers, telehealth received little or no attention at the federal level and only staggered inconsistent looks by individual states. Further, there appeared to be little pressure to make coordinated substantive changes to policy at the state or federal levels. To wit, telehealth's total percentage of healthcare claims in January 2020 was just 0.24%. Then, because no then time became no one's ally. The COVID-19 pandemic hit, thrusting the backs of proponents, opponents, and lukewarmness of telehealth and telehealth policies against the wall hard. The result, as you can see on the slide, April 2020's percentage of healthcare claims delivered via telehealth, 13%. That's a more than 5,300% increase from just three months earlier. Yes, the desire of patients to talk to their doctors and receive healthcare services virtually was and remains the reason for the spike. However, without the quick action of policymakers at the state and federal level, much of this demand would have remained unmet regulations and statutes impeding the use of telehealth, some that have been maligned and under consideration for years to be, were waved away in an instant and with no afterthought. Policy would no longer be an inhibitor to the use and adoption of telehealth and virtual care services. While the immediate implication was clear and impactful, advocates for its use would now see their theories and arguments put to the test in a way no one could have ever designed or imagined. We would now be able to see for the first time whether remote care services could deliver for patients as so many had claimed it could and provide the examples, trend, and data to demonstrate for policymakers that the laws and regulations waved away during the pandemic should not just be snapped back. Will those laws, regulations that restrict telehealth be put back in place? That's a question that I hear most often. What other changes can be made to help patients continue access care remotely after the pandemic? This is a close second. What can I do to help advocate for these changes? That is one that I'm getting asked more and more. Today, I'll look to answer each of those the best I can. While I won't be able to address each and every change that was or could be made at the federal level and by the state of Minnesota, I'll go through the most significant ones and give my take where I think, as of now, they are most likely to end up. I'll close with suggestions on how you can most effectively advocate for the changes you think are most important. So let's start on the federal level. Before I get too far, let me level set on a couple of things. First, the federal policy changes I'm referencing primarily impact the Medicare program. Though not directly impacting commercial or state health plans and policies, as uh, the previous speaker noted, the largest healthcare purchaser in the country has significant, uh, significant ripples on its decisions across the healthcare spectrum. Second, many of the temporary changes enacted by Congress or CMS are set to be in effect until the end of the public health emergency for COVID-19, which we'll just call the PHE. President Biden's administration is fully in control of when the PHE ends, even though it must be officially renewed every 90 days. It has indicated, however, that it will be renewed for at least the remainder of 2021. The extended PHE removes significant pressure on Congress and CMS to make permanent changes to telehealth policies 
and enables a more thorough review of what is working, what isn't, and what else should or needs to be changed. Large amounts of data and analysis will, will be released in the coming months, allowing the public to get a clearer picture of just how effective or ineffective telehealth has been. Finally, I won't address the issue of payment or reimbursement today. While these issues are certainly key elements of telehealth policy, they typically end up becoming the elephant in the room and the only thing that gets discussed. I'll leave that full discussion for another day and note two quick things. First is that many telehealth advocates believe payment parity or something close to it is a critical non-negotiable part of successful adoption of telehealth and that failure to provide this only results in misaligned incentives that will remove or severely curtail potential benefits to patients through making virtual appointments less attractive than in-person to physicians. This may be true. It may not be true. My only comment to this is that moving to value-based care payment models would help to solve this issue. My second brief note is that telehealth services do need to be paid in a sustainable manner. So as to help ensure that there is in-person location to go to when necessary. All right, now we'll get on to uh, the rest of the items for today. Although interest groups and advocates are split on how quickly the federal government should take permanent how, how the federal government should take permanent action on telehealth, there are a few policy items that nearly everyone agrees needs to change sooner rather than later. I'll start there, as these are of significant consequence to patients. First is the removal of 1834M restrictions by Congress, or more simply, permanently removing restrictions on patients accessing telehealth from wherever they are located. Without congressional action, at the end of the PHE, telehealth will only be accessible to people living in qualifying rural areas and to patients who are located within a certain set of facilities. While there is some room for CMS to regulate within those definitions, this will largely be the case. Across the healthcare spectrum, there are varying and differing opinions on almost every aspect of telehealth. This is not one of them. Second is coverage of audio only services. This can be done administratively, but absent this action, coverage of audio-only telehealth will cease to be at the end of the PHE. While this one is not quite the love fest that geographic and location restrictions are, most agree that some coverage of audio-only telehealth is necessary. This is because it can help to bridge the growing digital divide and lack of broadband access experienced by many in the United States while we all work to roll out a more robust broadband network, allow patients who are unfamiliar with poor or poor with technology to access their physician and it can also help to address health inequities. Before I move to the final and significant temporary change at the federal level that I'll note today, let me briefly touch on changes to remote physiologic or remote patient monitoring. CMS made significant permanent changes to RPM within the last few months. Physicians can now collect RPM data from patients with chronic and or acute conditions. They also clarified the requirement that a physician-patient relationship must exist prior to RPM services, though that requirement continues to be waived at, for the length of the PHE. Nevertheless, a physician-patient relationship can be established in most places via an audio-visual telehealth appointment, moderating the impact of this restriction. Additionally, CMS made key changes to how RPM is billed that make it easier for physicians and clinical staff to effectively use RPM within a patient care plan. All this is to say, remote physiologic monitoring continues to become ingrained in the delivery of healthcare, a crucial and significant step for patients throughout the country. Now, to quickly wrap on federal telehealth policy, HHS and CMS are regularly reviewing additional telehealth services to add to its coverage and payment list, and this is something that we think will continue to be re revisited frequently in the coming year. The final temporary change at the federal level, and will help us transition to a discussion of state telehealth policy, is the temporary waiver of licensure requirements. Early in the PHE, CMS temporarily waived requirements that an out-of-state practitioner be licensed in the state where they were providing services when they are licensed in another state. That sounds great, right? Under this waiver, physicians could see a patient via telehealth no matter where they are licensed and the patient is located. As many of you know, and as Sue noted, however, that just isn't the case. The CMS waiver is clear that the state must also waive its licensing requirement to allow an out-of-state practitioner to practice within the state. Some states have done this, while others have not. 
Some like Minnesota allow it, but still impose requirements, limitations, and or fees on out-of-state physicians who want to practice telehealth here. And therein lies the crux of the issue. There are historically good reasons for these restrictions. I won't go do too deep into that part of the discussion here, and I'm not advocating to remove them fully. The bottom line is this, however, for patients to fully realize its benefits, there needs to be a discussion of how state licensure applies to telehealth. Like many other issues, a state patchwork will present obstacles to consumers being able to get what they want or need. This likely hits close to home for many in the rare disease community. Access to a specialist or desired physician via telehealth can be impeded due to licensure restriction. Though I'll note some states like Minnesota do have openings for this. Even outside of the pandemic, the expense, uncertainty, and time required of travel can present obstacles. Knowing you'll be able to access the doctor you want, where you want, and when you want has the potential to be a significant relief for many. Again, this isn't to say the existing licensing requirements are not without merit, the but the reality and future of healthcare does require us to take a closer look at how they are managed in the future. Federal solutions have been proposed in the past. For example, making the originating site the same as the distance site for purposes of telehealth, thus eliminating the need for multiple state licenses. Though nothing has come of this proposal, and it raises many issues of its own, such as liability, malpractice insurance, et cetera, it, prevent, it presents an option and opens the discussion, something that needs to be part of any discussion of virtual care delivery moving forward. Now, moving to the state level, and as the previous speaker noted, there was a hearing today uh, on the state telehealth bill, and there's a hearing next week in the Senate. This is something Medical Alley Association has been very active in, and we're excited to see this bill continue to move forward. Although changes at the federal level received the lion's share of attention over the last year, the loosen, loosening of restrictions on telehealth by states was potentially more consequential to its accessibility and rapid adoption. Now, with the end of the pandemic in sight, states too, too have to determine which flexibilities to continue, add, or allow to expire. Making things even more interesting is that there is no uniform telehealth act for states to adopt. Each state has its own definition, allowances, coverage and payment requirements, limitations, and other laws and regulations for telehealth. Instead of boring you for the remainder of my time with a state-by-state analysis of key elements, I'll use Minnesota as a stand-in and an example of what policy options are available for state leaders as we move into the next normal. If you are interested in looking at a state-by-state -state comparison, I strongly encourage you to check out the Center for Connected Health Policy. They have a number of resources and comparison tools and reports to examine how telehealth laws, regulations, and flexibilities vary by state. Minnesota was fortunate coming into the pandemic to have one of the more forward-looking telehealth statutes in the country already on the books. Leadership from State Senator Julie Rosen and others gave Minnesota patients clear access to what was then a method of delivery care that was still finding its way. Commercial health plans were already required to cover telehealth services. Store and forward and asynchronous care delivery models existed on the books. A physician-patient relationship could be established via audio-visual visual telehealth. And medical assistance, Minnesota's Medicaid program, had its own telehealth statute. Though the state did not have to start from scratch when the pandemic hit, significant changes needed to be made. And state policymakers rose to the occasion. They allowed patients to access telehealth from their home. They added audio-only phone calls to the definition of telehealth. The previous statutory three telehealth visit per week limit for MA patients was removed. Though these changes were only temporary, combined with the existing telehealth infrastructure already in statute, it provided Minnesota patients with the lifeline they needed to access care during the pandemic. Much like at the federal level, the debate currently happening at the state legislature is which of these temporary changes should be continued. What else about Minnesota's telehealth regime should be modified? How, this, how can the state pr preserve flexibility for patients to access quality, clinically appropriate care remotely? Overall, these are not the simplest questions to answer. There are, however, a few pieces that are likely to find their way into permanency. Patients will be able to access telehealth in the most convenient location for them. Audio-only phone calls will, in some form, remain as a recognized form of telehealth. Telemonitoring, or remote patient monitoring, will be a specified coverage required form of telehealth services. MA patients will have an increase in the number or have the cap removed of telehealth visits permitted per week. These are the highlights. There are many, many more provisions that are under consideration, 
certainly payment parity, virtual care networks, and licensing, as mentioned earlier, that will take substantial debate and time to realize. These are not, however, as fundamentally tied into the pandemic as others. Although I'll note, Minnesota is one of a few states that had payment parity already in place prior to the pandemic. So that moved its direct link away from the temporary provisions. As I mentioned earlier, Minnesota is, one, is only one state and each state has its unique issues. And all of the issues I mentioned, even those that are likely to get, likely to move the direction I noted are far from being finalized. What is not unique, however, is that the core issues we are dealing with here are similar to those around the country. How can state policymakers preserve patient ability to access quality care via telehealth? Minnesota certainly doesn't have a monopoly on what that looks like, but its focus is certainly in the right place. Now, keeping these temporary expansions in place is going to require effort from everyone who's interested in making it happen, as the previous speaker noted. Although many interest groups and trade associations, including my own, are actively working on telehealth issues at both the state and federal levels, the direct involvement of patients impacted by telehealth and potential changes is critical to the discussion. That's easier said than done, however, for many. Fortunately, the pandemic has also provided new opportunities for citizens to more easily weigh in and influence the policymaking pro process. Rather than having to take a day or half day off to visit policymakers, you can set up virtual face-to-face -face meetings with them or their staff when it is mutually convenient. Sound familiar? Nearly all policymakers are taking advantage of the opportunity to hear from impacted citizens more frequently. Don't be offended if you only get to talk to staff any staff member, particularly at the federal level. Policymakers are busy and have many demands in their time. What's important is that you are making an effort to share your story so it won't fall into deaf ears or get lost in the shuffle. Having a successful meeting requires a little bit of planning, but in no way requires you to be an expert on the topic or the legislative process. When requesting the appointment, be sure to be clear about what it is. And if you're thinking about, and as you're thinking about how to frame your story, it's helpful to bullet out for yourself some of the key items I've mentioned today, what you've read about, or that a patient advocacy group such as NORD has provided to you. When you get into the meeting, be polite and tell your story. This is where you are more effective than lobbyists ever will be. Be clear that you're there to talk about how telehealth is important to you and your family. Tell them how policy is impacting you. It's impacting your children, your wife, mother, father, grandkids. Tell them how telehealth has been beneficial Telling your story and walking them through how you or your family has used telehealth, how it's impacted you, and what you stand to lose if it how it goes away. That story will do more than any set of talking points or policy changes can. Don't ramble. You don't want to take up the whole meeting or at risk having your message lost. And when you're done, be sure to listen. Listen to what they're working on, what they need, and what questions they have. Be sure to answer any questions you have the best they can. But don't be afraid to say you don't know. They aren't expecting you to be an expert. And at the end, be sure to thank them for their time and offer yourself as a resource. The same general process goes for writing an email. Identify yourself, keep it brief, and use short paragraphs. I'm happy to serve as a resource for any of you at any time. Don't hesitate to reach out. To learn more about legislation affecting the rare disease community and how you can advocate, stick around after today's programming to join the Minnesota Rare Action Network from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. At the end of formal programming today, you can join by selecting the agenda tab on the left side of your screen and scrolling down to enter the session. I've spent my time today outlining the telehealth flexibilities that came about because of COVID-19 pandemic and that due to broad adoption of telehealth are now under consideration for permanent adoption. I've also touched on a few items that while not directly tied to this temporary changes are nevertheless just as relevant to the long term implications of any permanent changes. What I didn't spend much, if any, time on was the framing that I laid out at the beginning, that in putting your opponents back against the wall, how time can be your ally or enemy, depending on your position. At the beginning of the pandemic, everyone's back was against the wall. But within telehealth policy, it was the opponents and lukewarmants who felt it most. Telehealth had arrived. Time has changed that. As more time has ticked by, more and more data on telehealth becomes available. This will allow for a more thorough review of whether or not telehealth is effective. For example, we need to better understand how it impacts health inequities and what policies or programs need to be adopted to prevent the digital divide from becoming a digital gulf. 
This closer review isn't bad, nor is it unwelcome. If telehealth isn't effective, then many of the flexibilities discussed today and other potential changes need to be rethought or abandoned. But we know that that just won't be the case after that review. What we can't allow, however, is for time to remove the urgency the pandemic has created. We need to evaluate telehealth and make a decision, whatever it happens to be. To do so otherwise is a disservice to patients, physicians, innovators, and the public. Otherwise, nothing will get done because no one's back is against the wall. Thank you. Great, this is uh, Paul Orchard uh, and uh, Jim introduced me briefly. Uh, but my role today is, uh, is the two things. Uh, first place, uh, I'm gonna introduce the next set of speakers and then we're gonna have a kind of an open forum uh, panel discussion after that. So the next four speakers are gonna have brief presentations. Uh, all of these are, uh, all the uh, people that are gonna be speaking uh, have interest in the telemedicine side of things, remote monitoring. And uh, following that, again, we'll have a series of questions that, that people can, can ask and address. And uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Rini Pierpont is gonna be the first speaker today. So Rini is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of uh, Neuropsychology. Rini is NIH funded to uh, look at uh, neurologic functioning in patients with rare disease, including adrenal leukodystrophy, and how that might be assessed uh, on an electronic basis. So again, um, monitoring that you may be able to do uh, remotely because the patients can do this in their own homes. So um, Rini, if you can take it from here. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, I am delighted to participate in today's panel and to present some examples of how our academic research in rare disease has been influenced by the pandemic. While I don't wanna minimize the adjustments and even overhauls needed to collect more of our research data virtually, my comments today will mostly focus on new opportunities that have presented themselves because there are many. 12 months ago when COVID was creeping into our communities, my lab was just launching a new study. Our goal with the study was to validate a new cognitive testing tool that was designed to precisely measure the coordination of young children's movements using their left and right hands. One of the rare diseases that my team is investigating is called X-linked adrenaleukodystrophy. A severe form of this disease causes the development of rapidly progressing lesions in the brain that appear in childhood between the ages of four to 10 years of age. In this MRI scan, the disease is evident in these bright white regions surrounding the ventricles of the brain. Since these brain lesions nearly always start in a brain structure that connects the two hemispheres called the corpus callosum, we hypothesized that we could detect the effects of these brain lesions earlier and more precisely if we could capture information about how efficiently the two brain hemispheres were talking to one another. We initially developed this test we call Hopscotch Kids as an application that can be administered on an iPad because this app would allow very precise measurement of the speed and coordination of children's hand and finger movements. This digital format also allowed us to present the test in a more entertaining game-like format where kids can earn stars and watch little animated videos after each test trial. Initially, we envisioned that this test would be administered similarly to the other traditional cognitive and motor tests that we use in clinic during an evaluation with an examiner who would explain and demonstrate the test before administering it to the child. However, when COVID arrived and the study had not yet even begun, it became clear that in-person research sessions could potentially be very limited for an unknown amount of time. This prompted us to reconfigure the app in such a way that the test could be administered entirely remotely. We developed instructional videos that prefaced each test session rather than having the examiner explain and demonstrate the task. 
So this is one of the instructional videos that teaches how to do one of the tests in which the child is asked to rapidly tap their fingers in an alternating pattern between their left and right hands. In this game, you will switch back and forth between tapping with your left and right hands. Left and right, left and right, back and forth until the frog swallows the fly. Remember to tap as fast as you can. After we reconfigured the app and um, it would provide instruction in the tasks without the need for a live examiner, we started our work in validating the test by collecting data to see about how healthy children performed across different test conditions. Data were collected from children from their homes uh, with the examiner present on Zoom to answer questions and to observe them completing the acti activities. In addition to the condition I just presented where children alternate tapping between left and right hands, we also collected data on performance speed with just their left hand and with just their right hand for comparison. We also developed a condition that I'll show you here where we measure the child's ability to tap the screen with both index fingers at the same time, which requires communication between the two brain hemispheres to precisely coordinate, coordinate those movements. So here's an example of a young research participant completing the simultaneous tap condition where they're encouraged to tap their two fingers at the same time. Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. All right. After testing, the app is able to transmit the data for storage onto a secure cloud server. Our research team is also able to review those Zoom recordings of the participant to identify if any trials were inadvertently disrupted, um, which enables us to retain a cleaner data set. Navigation of the study that I've just described required some uh, innovation and adjustment of typical procedures. Fortunately, there was already a rapidly growing foundation for digital testing. Cognitive testing with tablets and smartphones is becoming increasingly common, both in clinical and research settings. But there are still ways to go in identifying optimal procedures to collect the most accurate data possible, especially from pediatric patients who often require additional structure, encouragement, and explanation to comprehend a neuropsychological test and perform their best. As we develop better virtual methods to collect data accurately and efficiently from our patients with rare diseases, we will start to overcome significant barriers that have limited data collection for clinical research in neurologic disease. For example, we can reduce the burden on research participants to travel long distances to participate in trials. We can reduce the need for a specialized, highly trained examiner to be available at every site of a trial which often limits enrollment at smaller centers. These methods might also allow for more frequent testing when needed or increase the feasibility of longitudinal, longitudinal data collection to track long-term outcomes. Beyond my field of neuropsychology, the pandemic has clearly sped up what was previously a gradual transition to virtual methods of data collection. Uh, the vSafe smartphone tool is a great example. This is the tool that the CDC has been using to administer surveys via text messages and collect massive amounts of data about COVID exposure and symptoms after vaccination. These digital tools have a wider reach, they simplify study procedures, and they reduce human error that's inherent in paper and pencil surveys and tests. I wanna thank the University of Minnesota's Clinical and Translational Science Institute uh, because their funding and mentorship opportunities have made it possible uh, for my lab to develop this research strategy that we hope will provide new insights to benefit our rare disease patients. Thank you. Rini, thanks very much. Our next speaker today is Bob McGovern. So uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Neurosurgery uh, trained at Columbia and Cleveland Clinic, but now here is at the University of Minnesota. 
And uh, clinically, his focus is on surgical techniques and treating uh, difficult uh, epilepsy. But he has uh, uh, developed some wearable devices that uh, can provide sensing for patients that are having difficulty with gait um, and potentially are at risk for falls. And he's going to share that with us today. Bob, we'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Paul. Um, and you all can see my slides and hear me okay. Um, so uh, thank you for that introduction, Paul. Um, yeah, as, um, as you noted, I am uh, a neurosurgeon here at the university and at the Minneapolis VA as well. And um, in our lab, we focus on uh, using wearable sensors um, to look at uh, patients uh, with movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about how uh, I think um, we can use wearable sensors kind of as a model for uh, the intersection of telehealth and uh, precision medicine research. So, um, uh, one sec. there we go. So, um, wearable sensors were kind of uh, surrounded by them all, all the time. I would venture that the vast majority of people who are in the audience right now um, have wearable sensors on them right now in the form of their phones. Uh, which basically have accelerometers embedded uh, in almost all modern smartphones. Um, accelerometers and, and gyroscopes um, have now gotten to the point where they can be embedded in very small um, devices like this middle one and be used to study movements in a kind of very detailed way. Um, and there are lots of um, sensors that can be embedded, for example, like in, uh, in this watch on the right here. Um, uh, that measure things like skin conductance, um, heart rate, um, and also have accelerometers uh, to track movements. And they can be used to try to um, uh, predict a variety of things, right? So this watch is actually tries to use um, uh, uh, many different kinds of sensor uh, data to predict seizures. Um, and so we're kind of, um, uh, you know, a wash in all of this wearable sensor data. And the question is, how do we use it? Um, and how do we use it uh, well? And I think um, one of the, uh, you know, the approaches so far have been to try to um, look at different groups of patients. Um, so in other words, put a watch on folks with epilepsy and folks without epilepsy um, and look at group differences or put on accelerometers on uh, patients with Parkinson's and patients without Parkinson's um, and look at group differences. But what the approach our lab has taken is to try to um, uh, look at this in a more individualized kind of patient specific way. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, why that might be advantageous. So um, I'm interested in um, Parkinson's disease because I, I treat it as a, as a neurosurgeon with uh, deep brain stimulation by putting electrodes in the brain. and. Uh, PD is kind of characterized by four major symptoms or signs, uh, slowness of movement or bradykinesia, stiffness or rigidity, tremor, and then balance problems or postural instability. And although we don't have a cure for PD, we are, are pretty good at treating the first three um, symptoms or signs of PD with a combination of medications and, and sometimes surgery, but we're pretty bad at treating balance problems. And so that's um, why I'm kind of interested in it um, uh, in, in these patients. And I should note that Parkinson's disease is obviously not um, uh, considered a, a rare disease, but there are many other forms of Parkinsonism uh, in which balance problems are a prominent feature and um, are considered rare diseases. And so we use PD as our model, but it really can be kind of applied to uh, many different um, uh, diseases, including rare diseases. So um, just briefly to give you a sense for, for what we do, uh, we started out using wearable sensors in the clinic to try to char better characterize balance in PD patients um, and develop a like patient specific profile. And so these are the sensors that we use. Um, uh, we are, are not everybody always looks so dapper as, this, as the, this model here, but this is the general sense for, for uh, the sensors that we use in the clinic. And um, when we test patients balance in the clinic, what we do generally is kind of stand behind them and just give them a pull backwards. Uh, and then we assess them with 
RIs and give them a rating on a scale essentially from zero to four. When you put sensors on them, you can get a lot more detailed data as you might imagine. And so if you look at the um, figure here uh, on the y-axis is just how big a step they, uh, somebody takes and on the x-axis is just a measure of how hard we pull them. And uh, the details are not uh, super important, but just to give you a sense that if you did this in a hundred different people, you would probably see a hundred different of these uh, trend lines basically. So everybody has their own kind of individualized response. And um, so, but the problem with um, our clinical tests is uh, even when we, even when we can kind of quantify them like that, uh, they're not very good at predicting how people do out in the real world. And in particular, when we're talking about patients with balance problems, um, and neurological disorders. We're talking about falls, injuries, uh, things like that. So none of our clinical tests really can predict uh, who is going to fall and when they're going to fall if they haven't fallen before. Um, and so uh, we thought that we would try to adapt um, our tests that we're doing in the clinic um, uh, to the home setting uh, with the thought that this might kind of obtain a better idea of how patients experience um, uh, walking, balance, and those kinds of issues at home or out in the, in the real world. And then can we, can we send people home with wearable sensors and then use that data to develop uh, individual, uh, individualized profiles, both in the clinic and at home? Um, and, and, you know, in order to kind of give us a sense of what the difference is between uh, those two settings, but also, you know, are there specific aspects of their balance um, at home in particular that we could potentially intervene on. So is there a time of day when they're experiencing more falls um, or more, um, um, uh, or are they less mobile at certain times of the day? And is that related to their medication use? Or is there a certain region of their home environment where they consistently um, fall over? And, and you know, would it be beneficial to set, send an occupational therapist out to, to do a home eval? Things like that. Um, that we can that we can do to, um, you know, make it more uh, patient specific to improve outcomes, and so this is a project that we're working on with uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Rajamani in mechanical engineering and our grad student Ali Nuriani, and so what we're doing is kind of sending people home with just a few of these accelerometers, and then trying to characterize the types of activities that they do at home, so then we can really kind of um, move in, uh, zoom in on in further detail on on, on how they. Um, and how they move at home. And so I'll just, I'll just show you one last um, little figure here where basically we had people do uh, 10 different kinds of activities. So they were standing and walking, sitting, turning, lying down. And um, uh, we recorded them for just a period of 10 minutes and had them, uh, we recorded exactly, you know, kind of with the video when they were doing it and when they um, transitioned from activity to activity. And then um, we use these sensors, basically we used a, a bunch of days of um, time of uh, sensor usage and developed a model to predict, you know, what the um, person was doing um, based only on the sensor activity and um, then ran it through this 10 minutes of data where we knew exactly what they were doing. And what you can see is the blue line is uh, reality and the orange line is what our kind of model predicted and there's really not much difference in and, um, and so, you know, we are uh, kind of excited about, um, about uh, using this model to be able to correctly kind of classify how people are moving at home. So then we can really um, develop patient specific kind of interventions uh, in the future. So um, yeah, I just wanna thank uh, um, on my collaborators in uh, mechanical engineering and then the, the folks in, in my lab um, and if uh, you ever have any um, interest in um, these kinds of topics, my info is at the bottom there. Uh, so feel free to email and call me whenever. Thank you. Great, thanks, Bob. So uh, both Bob and Arini are uh, assistant professors here at the University of Minnesota and are clinical researchers, but we thought it would be important to have uh, perspective of industry as well. So Bill Benton is uh, the next speaker. Bill is uh, trained as an electrical engineer and is president of the uh, Benton System Solutions Group. 
and has extensive experience in developing telemedicine. I think he mentioned 30 years or so and uh, developing wearable devices as well. And so he's gonna give us the industry perspective on things. Bill? Okay, very good. You can hear me. Now it's time to share. All right, uh, share screen. Sorry, I'm just takes a minute to pick the right screen here. There we go. And come on, share. And do the display. Okay, I assume by now everybody can see the uh, uh, presentation here. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. I guess I'm the token engineer and scientist. Uh, I am a physicist as well as an electrical engineer. Uh, but I'm here to talk about the magic behind the curtain. Uh, and from a technological perspective, what's been developed to help you as physicians, clinicians, and people treating rare diseases, uh, we're designing and bringing the tools to you. 30 years ago, I stood on the aircraft carrier of the USS George Washington, and we beamed images back to Bethesda and to Walter Reed Medical Center as some of the earliest demonstrations of telemedicine. There we had million dollar systems and the force of the government behind us to send and, and bring information back to clinicians and let them look at it rather than bring patients back. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, I helped develop a uh, pulse oximeter that was the first Bluetooth connected approved uh, pulse oximeter for talking to phones and carrying clinical information. So we went from big machines to little machines. Uh, fast forward to this time frame, and now we're talking about bringing that technology home. So with a 30 year perspective, personally, I'm kind of focused on uh, where, where have we been, but more importantly, where are we gonna go? And I am here on behalf of one of my clients today, the uh, S3 Connected Health. So the slides and examples you're gonna see are based on the work that we've done with them on, on building solutions uh, for remote monitoring. So the unique challenges of rare disease, and, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but there's the perceived stigma, feeling of isolation, getting support of, of stakeholders, and, and looking at dispersed and poorly supported patients. And how do we utilize digital technology to really help solve some of those problems? And, and in, in this instance, we can, digital can provide a, a, a single platform. So we can pull patients, uh, providers, uh, caregivers, family and into one platform that'll allow us all to take a look at that information. So that's one of the first things we can do can pull together all of that information in one place that we can uh, basically uh, look at this. Um, secondarily, the digital platform could get patients talking to one another about what's going on and looking at what's happening in, in regard to uh, talking about their con uh, condition over here. The developing skills to help them understand and self-manage their condition and addressing barriers uh, with perceived need for treatment. Digital offers innovative ways to connect patients and reducing psychological distress. Uh, there are groups like patients like me, uh, there are digitally connected communities that are talking about this. And if nothing else, you could find out more information online than you ever could before. Now, the problem is sorting through that information and getting to uh, good and relevant information, but that's another problem we could talk about uh, in, in the future. And finally, over here, one of the questions we were talking about, or I was asked to talk about, is how to utilize digital technology to look at um, new treatments, uh, new medications, and, and new ways to deal with rare diseases. And so I'll talk a little bit about research, digital platforms that will allow pharma to address the lack of local knowledge whether you're putting together a clinical trial for a drug or you're looking at some of the testing that our earlier speakers talked about, being able to take the, the patients and the tests to the manufacturers of the medication or the people like myself and other, others in the medical industry who are developing the solutions, digital platforms allow us to do that. I'm gonna give you a couple of case, case studies here. One of the first ones I want to talk about is for monitoring uh, disease progress for neuromuscular diseases. And, and specifically in this case, it's spinal muscular atrophy. And this is a real project. These case studies I'm going to talk about aren't 
a hypothetical. And, and I'd like to point out one thing. Um, much of our previous discussion was around where, what it's like here in the US, whether it's reimbursements and infrastructure and that sort of thing. I'm going to point out that some of the programs I'm talking about are worldwide. In many ways, not technologically, but from the infrastructure and adoption point of view, the US is behind the rest of the world. So these programs I'm talking about are, have actually been deployed worldwide in many instances and are available. This system is a validated digital assessment for rare neuromuscular disease. We worked with the uh, uh, client to create standardized uh, testing and record of disease progression. Uh, we put together tools and a framework for the patients to get engaged along with their caregivers. Um, by pulling this information together, we can do population analysis, uh, clearly by uh, uh, de-identifying the information and that sort of thing, but that's one of the powers of aggregation of data, pulling it together is we can get the big picture rather than the individual picture, and then standardizing clinical practice. And so this tool has been launched and it's in conjunction with Biogen and it's looking at spinal muscular atrophy. And the important part here is it works at all aspects of the, the, the treatment. It can, you're utilizing it at the drug stage when you're testing a new therapy or a new drug, uh, allows you to do timely treatment. It supports reimbursement criteria and, and things like that. Uh, it, it pulls stakeholders in. Uh, clinicians, the caregiver, the patient needs, looks at the behavior of what has to happen. We do patient journey modeling and tracking, looking at a day in the life of the clinician, the, then the, uh, the patient, their caregivers, uh, put together a program uh, called Track SMA, and it's in service across 30 countries, which means it's scalable. It provides software as a solution. It's a platform upon which you can build. And while it's targeted towards SMA, you can apply it to other applications as well. It allows you then when you're operating and, and monitoring patients then to monitor effectiveness and outcomes. So not only can we use it during the development, but it generates real world evidence. And whether I'm a device maker or a manufacturer where I'm required to provide real world evidence or a pharmaceutical company that, that is showing the efficacy in its drug as it sorts through 100,000 different formulations or molecules down to the 10, they're gonna make it into clinical trials. We could generate real world evidence and provide it back uh, to the people developing the solutions. And then finally, it generates that consistently across all countries. So you can measure and improve outcomes. So with this deployed into 30 countries, we have not just a snapshot of one area or one section of, of, of the United States. Or, uh, we're able to look at the disease progression across uh, the world. The next example I wanna talk about is an integrated uh, therapy support for uh, MS. And in this case, we brought together a, a, connect, a collection of technologies we have a connected device, basically a drug delivery, self-administered drug delivery device uh, uh, for the client, built a mobile phone patient interface so they know what they're talking to and working with. We can then take that information, take it to the cloud and, and generate everything from payer reports because after all, it's important that people are getting compensated and, and reimbursed for what they're doing. We can do data analytics once we've collected that information and look at that in terms of the individual and how they're doing, whether it's an adherence question, are they taking their meds, what's happening, how is their disease progressing? It also gives us insight into the disease and, when, and, and this has been deployed in 40 countries and it's demonstrated over 80% adherence to their medication and to taking the right level of, of, of medication when they're supposed to. And you can see that the, the nice thing about the digital core, if you think of it is it encompasses care plans, treatment management, clinical support, visiting nurses, all of these elements that go into treatment of a patient can now be collected and pulled together and, and looked at. Um, I wanna talk about how it impacts drug life cycle. You see the drug discovery, clinical development and commercialization. And I wanna talk just very briefly um, as kind of a closing thought on how technologies are impacting all pieces of this uh, 
uh, treatment. And I've chosen in this case drugs, but it applies equally well to everything from neurostimulators to pacemakers to devices that are being built as well. But in the R&D and the research and the drug discovery, the use of artificial intelligence to look at patterns and things that the human eye may or may not be able to see. Um, there's a lot of hype around it. If you don't have AI today, you probably don't have a real product in many, many people's minds, uh, but there's a lot of validity in it as well. Analytics, which is looking at all of that data, starting to do something with it. No physician wants my uh, ECG 24-7, 365. They want to understand when I'm going to have an episode, when something's going to happen so that they can uh, have treatment available for me and take care of me you know, post-treatment for 30 days. And genomics, which was mentioned earlier as well. In the clinical development world, as we move from the research into actually trying things out, Smartphones and wearable sensors, you heard a little bit about those as well, are being used. One has to be careful. If you're going to make medically relevant decisions, you have to design your devices to give you that, the right kind of information in the right place. And, and that's one of the most interesting conversations I usually have with clients is the difference between consumer product and a medical product and how we can merge those together in, in the sensor fusion and, and data fusion and look at things broadly. Digital biomarkers or something can be done here. And then finally, when you commercialize it and bring it out to, to uh, production, you have connected drug delivery devices, such as the one that I showed for the MS example. You can have drug and digital patient support, and you can have digital therapeutics with behavior modifications and that sort of thing coming into play. And I'll say from my perspective of having been doing this for over 30 years and having worked on everything from heart, lung, to hearing, to pulse ox, and a variety of things. One of the things that we haven't really taken advantage of is the ability to pull together all this different information around a patient and put it together in a contextual whole that makes the patient the center of the universe rather than their narrow little aspect of the disease. And that's one of the biggest challenges facing med device players, the way we're structured today. Are we treating a disease or are we treating a patient holistically? I'm a huge fan of the power of pulling in all the information and looking at it. And I think that's one of the things that's, that this really does enable. And finally, I wanted to leave you with a real brand new breaking news just to show the immediacy of this. Earlier this week, ICON uh, acquires PRA. Uh, and the significance is that this, they paid $12 billion, that's billion with a B, for a, a CRO company, basically, to acquire mobile and connected health platforms and real world data and information solutions, putting them together so that they can have a hybrid of of decentralized and hybrid trial solutions and putting those out and bringing them out. And they're gonna use app to enroll patients, collect clinical outcome data and conduct virtual patient visits. Visits. So I wanted to bring that to the table simply because at, at this point in time, it's real world uh, breaking news, $12 billion to combine research organization with a data gathering organization. So how are we gonna run trials in the next five years through 30 years? All I could say is after 30 years of doing this, it's great fun. You shouldn't be technologically limited. You might have been 10 years ago. You're not today. So let's, uh, from my perspective, let's get on with it and let's uh, go solve some more problems. Thanks very much. Great, Bill. We appreciate those uh, perspectives. Um, the final uh, panelist today is, is Stephanie Tomlinson. And Stephanie has a, a unique aspect of um, uh, things we want to talk about today. In particular, Stephanie is a, the parent of a child with a rare disease and is an advocate for patients and families that, that are touched by these types of disorders. And she's been uh, quite active in uh, putting forth um, you know, advocacy in terms of how we might better care for the family. So we thought it'd be important to have Stephanie talk with us as well today. So Stephanie, I will turn this over to you.
Stephanie, I, I can't, I can't hear you. I don't know if others can. Hi, this is Stephanie. Can you hear me now? Sorry. <laughs> that would get through this whole conference without that. As Dr. Orchard uh, introduced, my name is Stephanie Tomlinson and I am a parent of a rare disease child. Uh, my son is 21 years old and um, was diagnosed at the age of five after five very long years of, of trying to discover what uh, was ailing him. Not only uh, did we go along a journey of in Minnesota looking for diagnosis, but we researched and went all across the country trying to find care and resources that would give him a better quality of life. Since 2013, my son has been a research patient for his rare disease with the NIH. Usually we travel to Bethesda, Maryland two to three times a year for his care and for updating the, his disease and the progression of things. Because of the pandemic, he has missed out on a year's worth of in-person care. Fortunately, he has been able to participate in his clinical trials related to his disease via telehealth. For this experience, we used a virtual link that was sent to us by the NIH. The research team was able to see him in his own environment and able to record and ask questions that were pertinent to his diagnosis and prognosis. We were able to go over symptoms that qualified him for, the, for a study and determine that when the NIH reopened, we would be back there to continue his initial study and also be part of additional studies that were found during our telehealth visits. Also during our NIH telehealth visits this last year, they were able to see that he needed different medications in order to maintain his disease um, progression or to, sus or to deter the, the disease progression. And they were able to send us some things through the mail to help until we were able to get back to the NIH. Ted was also able to participate in a study that was using current technology um, he was using a simple fitness tracker, similar to what some of the other uh, specialists were talking about. And um, by using this fitness device, his team was able to monitor his activity level as it paralleled with his symptoms. They could see his ability to maintain a number of minutes of physical activity and how his heart was recovering from that. They were also able to see how long it took him to get back to a baseline after su sustaining a significant illness. This was done with proprietary software and it was also uh, done with virtual communication uh, via Zoom. Uh, throughout our participation in the process with virtual studies and telehealth, we were able to maintain a eyes on approach to my son's condition. And we were able to add an additional layer of research that will allow more data and hopefully a treatment that will eliminate some of his pain. While I know we have a long way to go for a treatment plan for his particular rare disease, I'm grateful that we were able to stay in contact with his research team at the NIH and still monitor his health and be able to move things forward and not lose time. As a caregiver, I was asked to participate in a research project the NIH had recently developed. Due to the pandemic, the project had to be redeveloped in order to go into a telehealth mode. Via surveys and virtual meetings, I was interviewed for six hours over an eight week period to assess the effects of caregiving for patients who have a rare disease. This process uh, was very invasive and um, it was a great opportunity for me to be a participant in, in a study that paralleled my son's disease to look at the correlation. I don't think we would have had that opportunity had we not had telehealth come into play because we wouldn't have been local to the NIH to participate. So I'm really thankful that we were thought of through his research team to be part of it. And that's it. Great, thanks, Stephanie. So uh, we're gonna open this up to, to questions now in a panel. So I hopefully everybody uh, that was Previously presenting, if you can um, get your videos going and and uh, your mics as well, and then we can start uh, with the question and answer period. 
So, and there's a number of questions that have come in and I'll try to get through some of these. And then there's other questions that have, that have got here kind of on the side as well, but maybe we'll start at the top here. So uh, there's a question regarding um, the opportunities in regards to telemedicine and how that might extend into both the care of patients as well as research, but what can be done to reach some of the communities of color and uh, those that may not speak English to help um, involve them more in telemedicine and to address their healthcare needs. So I think we'll, I think I'll have Sue address that one. So um, I would extend um, that to almost any underserved population, although um, persons of color are underserved, certainly in rare disease. Um, but um, with regard to separate languages, I've been remarkably surprised and pleased with the facility of being able to engage, because you're on telemedicine together, um, interpreters to provide care for using telemedicine. Um, I was surprised to find that it could be done with a great deal of effect, almost to the point where when I go back into person and the interpreter isn't in the room with us physically, it's almost easier if it was a telemedicine visit because you just have another partner in the conversation. Um, so I see a lot of potential for being able to um, do a better job helping people who are non-English speaking. Um, I think that many of the societal limitations with regard to outreach for medicine for persons who are underserved, persons of color, persons who are economically disadvantaged will um, are gonna be continuing recalcitrant problems. Um, and it's really up to us as a society to find ways to make healthcare more equitable generally, including with telemedicine. Um, but that has to be, I think, a societal and a personal priority on the part of the providers. Great, thanks, Sue. So, and I just wanna remind the panelists as well. So if uh, as part of these discussions, uh, any anybody on the panel wants to address anybody else in the panel in terms of questions or or follow-ups, then you know please feel free to to do that. Uh, another question: There's a vision for uh, telehealth to allow multidisciplinary consults in, integrated into one session, and um, you know could this be done, and how easily can it be done, and um, so I, I don't know who wants to handle that, Bobby or Sue, for instance, if, if you want to take that one on. Okay. Maybe Rini can also comment, but um, one of the advantages that we've actually noticed in um, having a telemedicine visit is we can engage pretty much as many people as you want to put on the screen. So the potential could exist if you can wrangle everyone's schedule to have a wide variety of providers who could participate simultaneously. So I think there is real possibility for um, more integrated visits, but it, again, that ends up being a problem more on the scheduling side than the technology side, I would say. Um, could be a great opportunity though to have um, concerted care or a, um, a comprehensive clinic together um, with a summary at the end with all providers. I, I could see that as a model that could be really valuable for multidisciplinary care. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, if I could comment on that, because from a technological point of view, one of the challenges facing us is in the in the device space. I, I mentioned in my talk, I believe in sensor fusion. What that means is pulling information from wherever you can get it and looking at the patient holistically. So I think part of that has been structurally, we don't look at it that way often from a medical perspective. That's changing. Mayo Clinic's a great example of holistic care. Technologically, we have an issue in the med device space because we still tend to be focused around disciplines as well. So until we can drive standards so that you can get the, the, the blood work and, and all of the tests and the psychological tests and integrate that all together in a single package, it, 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 is, uh, it inhibits the ability of the clinicians to get all of that in one place. We're working on it. Uh, CMS is pushing some regulations for interoperability of EMRs and stuff like that. But the fact is our data is spread all over the world. Uh, you know, today. And until we pull that together and have it available in a nice, neat package, you clinicians aren't able to do what I truly believe you'll be able to do eventually. So from a technical perspective, that's my view. Well, it, it just in regards to that too, maybe maybe I'll ask a little bit of a follow-up because uh, as, as people mentioned, you know, we may be seeing a patient 
uh, from Minnesota, but the patient is in Missouri and they're having their lab tests done in Missouri. And it'd be nice to have, be able to pull up the lab tests, for instance, on a, uh, you know, a real time sort of basis or, or, or imaging or, or those types of things as well. So is there some sense that that can be done? Um, I, I don't know how to do that now, clearly, but I mean, whether that might be able to be, be done in the near future. Well, in, in February of 2022, if everything stays going the way it is, there will be some rules passed that will mandate that EMRs must allow you to exchange certain levels of information uh, between EMR systems. So that helps to bridge the gap. If it's in the EMR, there are going to be exchange protocols so that instead of getting a a PDF of 200 pages of whatever, they'll be able to share that information. And ultimately maybe me as a patient will have ability to pull that together. So 2022, there should be some legislation that's going to push for mandatory exchange of that information. That's a walk down the path. We still have a long ways to go uh, for some of that. But it's would, that in, would that include uh, data dense things like you know MRI scans and whatnot? Because those types of things are, are hard to pull across uh, you know, what our current technology allows us to do. Two years ago, I had brain surgery for a tumor and I had a neuroscientist over here and, and a surgeon over here and there were different plate locations. I got very good at schlepping discs across with the images because of that exact problem uh, of, of getting that information. When we beamed images to Bethesda and Walter Reed, we were addressing that with, with T1 lines and and high-speed uh, communication line. It is a problem. Uh, but today, you can pull up images around the world. The fact that we're doing this at, at HD bandwidth and sort of stuff, it, it can be done. Uh, one of the challenges, and all the speakers, I think, earlier, Susan and, and, and the gentleman from Medical Alley, making it financially viable and, and realistic. So we have the technology. Incenting the right players in the system whether it's a device company, a, a physician or a hospital, whatever it is, and sending them to pull all of that together is, is really, from my perspective, what needs to be done. The tech is there, but sometimes we don't get to it until it's legislated or mandated, or we have a pandemic. You know. Sue, did you want to weigh in on that too? I was just going to say, even though it is imperfect, we have already begun to see this happening with our friend Care Everywhere, um, those who use Epic as an electronic medical record often have access to um, Epics um, in other places. And if, for some of our remote patients, this has been instrumental in being able to support them because we have access to, it may not be real time, but it's pretty close um, to laboratory tests and whether we can see the images, we at least know what tests have taken place. So baby steps, but ones that I have found profoundly um, supportive for the distance care that I have for some of my kids with uh, rare metabolic conditions. Yeah, it seems like there's a finite number of uh, electronic medical records these days. And I, I think, you know, for those that aren't steeped in this, like some of us are, I mean, Epic, I think it's got 60 or 70% of the uh, electronic record sort of, um, you know, cases, but, but there's a few others, but you know, being able to extract that data would be really helpful. And I think there are, are groups like the CDC that are working on trying to get these things to happen as well, which would be really helpful for the, for the rare disease populations. Yeah. Well, for yeah. rare, maybe, maybe, sorry, go ahead, Susan. I was just going to say for rare disease populations, one of the things that should be um, a real strong desire is to be able to um, push information from electronic records into research data settings. Um, because that's how we're going to, you can't recopy data, hand move things back and forth. You can try it, but it doesn't work. What you need is direct access and conduits and ways to push data between clinical and research settings, of course, with appropriate permissions. And that's going to be the accelerator for research for rare disease. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just build on on this conversation and, and mostly on, on Bill's comment that you know, the key to the interoperability is the patients being able to have control of their data and having it be in a standard format. So no matter where they want to go, they can take it and have it have it be used. So, you know, the interoperability certainly is going to play a major part in this, you know, multidisciplinary setting, as is reimbursement and how that looks, you know, as the um, as you have more physicians on a call, 
you know, how that gets paid for is, you know, is going to be a bigger, bigger issue. I think also in terms of that, you know, establishing best practices and a standard format requires coordination across, you know, uh, at multinational sometimes institutions in rare disease. And uh, that that's a process that needs to take place um, from this perspective of, of people coming to consensus on what are the important measures to administer and how do we get them into the standard format that can be extracted from a record so that something can be made of that data when somebody has a research question that they want to answer. Yeah, I'd like and to I think some that. of these, sorry, I'd like to think sorry. some of these barriers are going to come down a little bit. I mean, we were working on a registry that's a national registry and uh, allowing the patients to consent electronically and then that consent allows us to pull their data from wherever they are. And it was logistically, um, it took a, took a while for the IRB to kind of get their heads around how this is going to potentially work. And so, you know, we eventually got it, got it off the ground, but uh, we've been talking about whether one can do this internationally too. And I don't think that if that's worked out, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so uh, hopefully these things will progress over time and we'll have a, a better opportunity to, to integrate these things. Rini brings up a really good point, and you just touch on it internationally. And, and the examples I use, I kind of deliberately chose for international examples. Not only do we have a problem of fragmented thing, um, regulations here and licensure in the States, but if I have to go to 30 or 40 countries to try and put something in place that's going to go across language barriers, go across the standards that Rini talked about, you look at things the same way and all, all of that. We, it, it is a huge challenge in how you manage and deal with that. And, and so, again, we have to think uh, kind of worldwide. And in some ways, they're ahead of us in, in, in terms of adoption and acceptance. But I'm an optimist around the technology. I'm more of a pessimist around the infrastructure, the, the constraints, the way we do business today. And, and Bobby mentioned it, Susan mentioned it, the licensure and the reimbursement. Until those things get fixed, I've got technological solutions that just aren't getting used. Well, let me follow up on that too. So, and I think Bobby was talking about this earlier as well, but I mean, <clears throat> there are some barriers to the telemedicine and some of these are on a state level and some of these are on a national level, but, um, and, and, you know, they may include certification and whether somebody in, you know, again, Minnesota can see a patient in Missouri based on malpractice issues and, uh, you know, those types of concerns, because I know our, our lawyers are anxious about those types of things. And um, so, I mean, is there an opportunity for patients with rare disease to kind of lead the way on these types of things and help push? And, and I don't even know which direction necessarily to go best. Is it you have to deal with the states first and then go to national or, or their means pulling in Nord or some of the other uh, groups that are out there to help influence policy on a national basis. I don't yeah. know who I'm asking that to, but anybody who wants to, to yeah. weigh in on that. So I, I can I can start and then others can can add on. I, I think that it, you know part of it is just raising the awareness that it's an issue. I think you know legislators and policymakers uh, you know see a lot of times see what's brought to them. And so if nobody is raising this as an issue, then it's then it's going to kind of slide by the wayside. So you know whether it's at the federal or state state levels, I think is you know as I noted in my in my remarks earlier, it's there's there's solutions at both places. It's you know but it's in raising the profile of that particular problem it has to happen first. And you know I'm not necessarily sure that we're there yet on that piece. Well, who's best Who's best position to do it? I mean, it, is it better coming, I mean, maybe Stephanie wants to weigh in on, on this a little bit too, but I mean, are, are there advocacy networks that uh, can influence the state and, and national policy in terms of this? And how do we, how would we go about doing that? That's a great point that you brought up. The advocacy groups are working hard for changing policy at a national level. We have um, Every Life Foundation that works directly with almost all legislative issues and is phenomenal at getting us organized and helping to bring us to the Capitol to speak with our legislative teams. I know next week I'll be speaking with all of my Minnesota representatives on rare disease issues. Um, this is definitely on our list as our group of five. Wouldn't we speak with uh, Senators Klobuchar and Smith on 
the impact this has on stalling out our, our care um, to eliminate telehealth. And we need to keep this in place. But not only that, I completely agree with, I am very good at schlepping documents all over the country. It would be much to everyone's benefit to have access across these EMR systems. And I'm not sure how that will happen, but that is something we definitely in the advocacy world is, are working towards. That and, and the research piece. Um, I know our disease group has fragmented natural history uh, studies going all over the place and yet nobody's really sure our exact number or our exact severity because we haven't been able to find a standard to compile all of the data. So to be able to push it from an EMR into a research base would be a dream come true because I think then researchers would be able to, to, to glean out what's necessary and to look, to look for what we need. And right now we are truly the needle in a haystack. So Bob and Rini can, maybe I'll ask this to you guys, but if, if you're doing clinical research across state lines, for instance, and trying to sign patients' families up to be able to do this, and uh, you know, what, are, what are the regulatory barriers to these things? What are the HIPAA kind of barriers to these things? And how, how does one best enact that? I mean, it, it's probably easier if they're initially our patients, I mean, patients that you've seen before that now go back home, but in some circumstances that there may be patients that haven't yet come here or would or, or can't, and can they still be enrolled? And how does one deal with that? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, I've done a, a, quite a bit of enrolling, um, both nationally and internationally for our research studies. And nationally, it doesn't tend to be a huge problem, although some um, medical institutions don't um, don't accept a standard HIPAA form that we use for research, even though that's approved by, you know, our institution. And so occasionally you'll have some pushback from institutions that, you know, want their specific form. But in general, um, this can be done pretty successfully. Internationally, it's a little bit more difficult because HIPAA is a federal law, and so it doesn't always apply in other countries. And so really figuring out what you need to do to comply with, say, the European um, uh, guidelines or, you know, and other, other um, parts of the world is, can, can definitely be a challenge to make sure you're doing the research ethically. Um, so those are, those are definitely issues, but I want to touch real quick on what was just brought up about kind of the importance of advocacy on the patient, um, uh, kind of the patient group realm. So I think there's advocacy both for improving access to telehealth, but also there can be advocacy in how to bring clinicians and experts together to develop consensus about what measures should be used. And that can be a big part of advocacy that can pull things along um, and, and speed things up if people are using similar um, strategies across institutions. And then the other thing I would say is that I think there's a big role for professional organizations as well in this advocacy. So I know the American Psychological Society is talking a lot about how do we lobby um, for, you know, changes in licensure requirements or, um, you know, being able to do telehealth across state lines. And I think those organizations, as well as the patient advocacy organizations, will have a really big role to, to play in pushing some of these things that we're talking about forward. And from an industry perspective, and I serve on a pediatric device board, actually, at the university, one of the challenges is, um, like it or not, um, the companies go to where the money is. And in rare diseases, as well as even in the pediatric side, we see that the populations are so small. That's why the drugs cost $140,000 a year for a rare disease or something like that. So from that perspective, um, incenting the companies to do development of, of some of those things is important as well, because their shareholders won't put up with a low return on something like that. I don't defend that. I just reflect having been in so many of these conversations over the years, the companies go where the, the money and the emphasis and focus is. Having said that, there is no advocate stronger than a parent who's worried about their kid or their child, and they can accomplish miraculous things when, when they get to it. So advocacy and focus is a big thing. But if left to our own devices, um, we, we go to where we're solving problems that are of a, a bigger nature. And we've shown we can do that. In pandemic, when it affects the whole world, we can move heaven and earth. If, if it affects, you know, 
10,000 people, it's less of an issue. We need to figure out how to wrestle with that as well. So. Well, I think that one of the keys that has been alluded to though, is that while individual rare diseases are rare, collectively rare diseases are not rare. And so organizations and advocacy activities that bring groups together to leverage that power are critical. Every Life has been a strong force in some of that. NORD as an organization has a very strong public policy um, advocacy group. And of course, I stole directly from their site to describe what their priorities are in telehealth. They're very engaged um, in that as a major priority because of the recognition that persons with rare disease need telehealth. So um, through your own individual organizations that are wrapped up into NORD and to NORD as an organization, um, there's an additional avenue where, you know, a larger voice can speak louder. Well, maybe there's an opportunity again for the rare disease uh, to, to lead the way on this. Because I think, Bobby, you'd alluded to before that if, if patients have gone to a particular institution and are, and are then, you know, uh, established there and then are going back to home, the rules may be different than trying to see the patient for the first time across state lines. And so uh, maybe maybe can expand on that a little bit because that, a lot of the families that have rare diseases may be you know, on the web or talking to advocacy groups and trying to figure out who the experts are for the various diseases. And then you know, they, they may be in Florida and want to talk to someone in Utah and can, can those barriers come down so people can to do that? Yeah, it, I mean, the short answer is yes, they can. It, you know, it, it will take efforts at the state or federal level to make that happen. And, you know, the licensing issue is one that is getting discussed, although not as much as the others, simply because of the, the time pressure that is under some of these temporary expansions. So, you know, it is, it, I think it's really important for the rare disease community in particular to weigh in with their, with their legislators at the state and federal level on, you know, how licensure issues could result in uh, challenges to receiving the care that they, that, they, that they want to get and finding opportunities to sort of bridge that. You know, this, it isn't a black or white issue on this. It isn't as if you have to remove all licensing restrictions in order to accommodate. But, you know, there are paths forward and, uh, you know, as I noted, it, you know, the, and others have noted here, patients are the best advocate for these kind of things and uh, can, sell, can tell the story and explain why it's important far better than I could or any other, any other uh, advocate lobbyist at the Capitol can. I couldn't agree more in my efforts to do advocacy activities. Our strongest allies are the families that we work with. I'm going to get back to a couple of the questions. It's been a great discussion, but uh, there's more com questions coming in and we'll see how far we can kind of get with these things. But uh, so there's an another question. I think this is probably newborn screening related about families that receive a diagnosis and then uh, they may have little information about where to go next or what the continuum would be your next steps. And telemedicine may provide an opportunity in those circumstances for people to get what they need in terms of uh, information and potential referrals. Um, so maybe Sue, I'll let you kind of ad address that as the newborn screening expert. And there's also a, a kind of a follow-up to that about uh, whether information can be obtained via surveys, for instance, to figure out what the barriers are to care for people in this situation. Well, so I would say that for newborn screened disorders, um, rather than people getting lost, they're enveloped into a system where they, um, if we can play our cards correctly and make things as efficient as possible, they are hopefully enrolled for lifelong care for their disorder. Um, it is difficult in the first encounter to not feel like you're completely alone, and that you no one else has ever experienced what you've experienced. And one of our jobs is to help families make those connections, to be aware of, of groups that can support them. Um, so if a child has probionic acidemia, I can steer them to the Organic Acidemia Association, which can really provide some parental um, and personal support from families who share their same experiences. Um, I, I think there are circumstances where a rare disease can be present 
where particularly if a family is experiencing a diagnostic odyssey, they feel very alone and very separated. And it can be really hard in those circumstances to provide the support that's needed because you don't know the answer. Um, I guess one of the keys I would have is that um, most of us who are doing those diagnostic odyssey type things um, really encourage families to continue to be followed, to return for care, to come back, even if we don't know an answer, because eventually we, we're not going to give up. We're going to keep trying to find that answer. So I, I, don't, I don't know that, I think there is a continuum of care, particularly after a diagnosis has been established. Um, the, from my point of view, one of the things that's hardest for families is coordination of care, finding someone who can help pull all the experts together. And that remains, I think, a real challenge for families. Well, and you and I have had this discussion, but uh, you know others as well. So another issue ends up being the transition of care from the pediatric side to the internal medicine oh, side, yeah. and yeah, and that's yeah. a you know that's a huge uh, set of questions. But in, in terms of centralization of care, I, I think we tend to do that better on the pediatric side than it tends to get done on the internal medicine side. But um, models to better develop those things and help in the transitions are, are going to be key. There's a lot of these, you know, a lot of these disorders that we're, what we're talking about used to be lethal disorders and they never lived into adulthood. And now it's a success story that they are, but now we have to figure out how to have lifelong care for these patients. And, Absolutely and correct. So that's a, that's another set of questions. So, um, well, that's exactly the, the point there, the place that we're at right now with our son. Um, he uh, is now 21 and we have aged out of the children's care system in Minnesota and had to almost raffle ourselves out to potential uh, providers to help him into the, into the adult world without starting over again. And luckily we had the guidance of our team at the NIH to help us sort of pick through some of the physicians in our area and, and with their knowledge and saying, well, I know that they have this or, you know, and we had to piece back together a team. And again, it's already hard enough to coordinate care. Imagine doing that all over again and being the parent who's an advocate where I know more about the disease than probably anybody else at the table and trying to pull that back together again. Um, it's, it's exhausting and it's terrifying to know that he's lived long enough. He's outlived his life expectancy. Like you said, that's amazing. But now are we going to drop the ball just because he aged out? I don't know. No, I, I couldn't agree that that's, from my point of view, one of the biggest challenges for care in rare diseases is the transition. And maybe there's a role for telemedicine in, in this too, because as patients get to be into their 20s or 30s, for instance, I mean, maybe they can bring in some of the people that were taking care of these patients when they were younger and help in modeling care. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we've gotten that far yet, but I think maybe there's opportunities to do those things as well. Innovations and in scheduling and billing would really be helpful in, in some of those things and making it so that providers can coordinate with each other better and that that is adequately reimbursed because it's going to make the care so much better. No, I, I would agree. And I think it's, it's, you know, clearly bringing in the people that have the expertise that you need to have a uh, global plan of care for a patient is huge, but there's, it's, it's difficult on a scheduling sort of basis to make those things happen. So um, <clears throat> there's a question about, uh, individual disorders like SMA and, and MS, and, and there may be uh, wearables that are relevant for particular diseases, and, and maybe there's several different wearables or tools that might be relevant for a particular disease, but uh, how does one go about integrating all these things and pulling it all together? And maybe that's a question for, for Bill here. Sure. I mean, I showed you a couple of examples for SMA and, and, and uh, multiple sclerosis and, and that sort of thing. Um, today, it truly is fragmented. And that's part of it is there's not standards. There's not standards necessarily of, of the way we communicate across countries. There certainly aren't 
standard ways of communicating across diseases and, and of integrating all these things. The best thing that we can do is, is build standard platforms. For example, we don't start over each and every time we do and treat a rare disease or even a common disease. You start with fundamentals are the same and you bolt pieces on, they get you where you need to be. You bolt on software packages. Um, and, and so those are available and hopefully they make it, you can get to market faster and there's a continuity. And there's only so many ways you can look at medical charts and displays and, and all of that. If we could define those, put them together, we're working at building on that. One of the biggest challenges is how do I blend medical and non-medical devices? Uh, we use, people talk about using cell phones. I'm an old Pulse Ox guy. I know on my cell phone that there's a, on an app I can use, it'll give me Pulse Ox. I know equally well that it only works on really well people who will do it exactly right and it won't work on the sick. How do we merge information you guys can really use? Um, I, I, I love the definition of big data. Uh, volume means a lot of it. Velocity, it comes at you fast because you're getting it big and huge. Veracity is one of the big things. It, is it truthful? Can you believe it? That's, after, uh, that's there. And then variety as I pull all these together. Those are the attributes in, that we've got to pull together and allow you to look at it. So I think we're better. I think we can churn out products more quickly and easily uh, uh, to, to, to do that. But there's not one magic bullet that says, here's the master system, just plug in your software module and go. But those of us in the industry are working on it from a software perspective. But my question I turn back to the medical professionals then is, Give me the format for how you want to see the information, the kinds of charts you want to see, and, and tell me that you're not ever going to change that from institution to institution to institution. <laughs> not going to happen. Well, so kind of related to that, I mean, you talked yeah. a little bit about uh, discovery and then clinical development and then commercialization, you know, as different pieces to things. So, yep. I mean, how does, how does something become validated? I mean, who, who decides that this is a, a tool that is, is reasonable to use. And for instance, insurance is going to pay for it. And, uh, and one thing on the, on the clinical research side is, you, you know, you can do whatever your grant is going to pay for, for instance. But, but if you're actually going to do some monitoring um, that uh, we have the license to use from the standpoint of it's not going to get rejected by the insurance company, I mean, how do you, how do you get there? Oh, well, that, that's a really big question because ultimately at the end, in the U.S., it ends at reimbursement. The holy grail for us as, as med device, I'm more of a device guy than necessarily software, but on hardware or software, you go through and you have to prove, the nice thing about it is in devices or in software, if you say your device is going to do something or your software is going to do this or your drug is going to cure something, like it or not, the FDA or other regulatory bodies say you have to prove it. You prove it through all the trials you do, you do it through clinicals, you do all of that, you gather the information and, and pull it all together, show it to uh, the right regulatory body and say, see, it works on 95% of the patients or 66% or whatever. But it's always a cost benefit trade-off, right? And some, most of you have gone through this. Is the is the cost of providing that new service, that new capability, that new drug, whatever it is, does it out, is it um, outweigh, is it all outweighed by the benefit? Is, you know, and, and that's a simple dollars and cents calculation. Unfortunately, particularly in rare cases, that's why things get to be so expensive. There's a pretty well-defined process of marching through that, getting reimbursement and making that happen. That, that we as device manufacturers in the medical industry know and understand. But the end of it, and this is why there's a huge cottage industry in uh, regulatory and reimbursement consultants is how you wade through that process, how you get to the uh, reimbursement stuff. Because if they don't reimburse for it, um, it's a big challenge. That's why a lot of device companies I know will go to the um, private pay world. Uh, if you wanna go somewhere and do a fun device, go into cosmetic surgery go into something like that where people with money pay for it and it's not life supporting. It's not that sort of thing, but it's optional. That's, that's where money is. So sorry, it's a long winded answer. There is a well-defined process to go through it, but it's prove that it does what it says and prove that the benefit outweighs the costs. That's where the challenge is. Again, I don't I defend it. I just sell it the way it is. I think for wearable sensors, the one of the really big challenges is that validation portion or the veracity, which is you know kind of what Bill was talking about, which is um, 
you know, uh, what, what are we trying to measure? And then how do we do that, especially for people um, who are, you know, wearing these sensors at home, because you don't really have a great, uh, you don't really have a great method of um, knowing what's happening all the time with them at home. You get this kind of continuous stream of data uh, potentially, but uh, there's not a real great way of validating it. It's something that we've come up with uh, in our research in particular, you know, you can't have a camera tracking them all the time. Um, uh, so it, that's a, that I think is a huge issue, especially in the movement disorder realm at least, is how do you know uh, that what you um, think you're tracking is what you're actually tracking and validating that, that data in patients. So, um, you know, we're trying to come up with some ways to do that, but um, that's a big, big issue for, um, for wearable sensor kind of big data studies, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would really, I would second that. Just, um, just saying, you know, when thinking about how balancing a lot of different pieces, there seems to be, you know, the precision of the measurement and the technology that you're balancing, the accessibility of the technology. Is it really expensive? Is it widely available? And then things like the burden on the participant and the researcher. So the participant might not like you know, wearing something or might not like the intensity that they have to do to, to validate um, a new tool. And the researchers may end up having to do a lot of sifting through on the back end, like you were saying with these sensors, really knowing what's good data and what, what was happening. And that, that can be very time intensive. And so, you know, having a technology that you can get that data relatively quickly is, you know, a big advantage, but it's really hard to get there and have all of those factors weigh in um, you know, to in a positive direction so that the technology is worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Our priority has really always been to make it as simple as possible for, um, for participants for, for that reason, right? So, I mean, uh, both in the number of sense, you know, so we try to minimize the number of sensors that we send people home with. And, um, you know, when we first started, we had them kind of use an app to try to control things. And it's just, it's too, it's too much for people most of the time. So now it's, we have a much simpler system. You just basically put them on and go home and then you mail them back. And um, I think you get probably better quality data that way, um, it, you know, and, uh, but it does involve a lot more work on the back end on our side, obviously, but, you know, we're kind of willing to, to, to do that at least at the beginning to, to figure out what's useful and what's not. And um, it's a bit of a trial and error thing, I think. So Bob, relevant to that, there was a question about wearable sensors uh, and, and research that might be done with patients with epilepsy. And I, I can imagine that, you know, one of the questions might be if somebody has intermittent seizures or, or whatever in their home alone and, you know, they have a seizure. I mean, can you, uh, do these things exist where in real time you can identify somebody that's having an, a, a prolonged seizure, for instance, and, and whether you know, that comes back to you or whether that comes back to a family member so we can help best care for people that have these kinds of problems? Yeah, there are, um, are, there are at least attempts at it, I think. Um, so there are watches that um, uh, try to keep track of whether or not somebody's having a seizure um, and then can, yeah, like um, try to send like an alert to some, you know, to like an emergency contact or, or something like that. Um, how well they work, I think, and there are like entire companies that are devoted to trying to, you know, um, figure out uh, uh, platforms for that. Um, how well they work, I think, uh, you know, I don't know um, uh, how good the data is on, on that, you know, um, but it, it does exist. And I think there's definitely a lot of a big push, especially um, for epilepsy um, to one predict, you know, when somebody might be having a seizure uh, or, uh, or going to have a seizure uh, based on uh, sensor data, um, but also once somebody does have one to try if they're alone, right? You know, like you said, to, to try and uh, like push notifications to, to emergency um, uh, contacts. Um, so it exists, um, uh, it's not very widespread, I would say. Um, and, uh, but certainly um, the other aspect of wearable sensor data in epilepsy patients are things like mobile EEG caps to get a sense for um, uh, what people's um, kind of brain activity looks like while they're at home rather than, you know, the traditional way of monitoring people is 
to have them come into the hospital and stay for a week, basically, and kind of induce seizures. Um, and so, and, and we're actually doing a study where, you know, the new deep brain stimulation devices actually allow you to record the intracranial recordings from inside the brain at home on the device. And so we're enrolling people right now and uh, looking at um, their, uh, you know, uh, brain activity while they're at home so we can study, you know, what, um, what their seizures look like at home and um, if we can, you know, change stimulation parameters and things like that to, to improve their seizures. Um, so uh, I think the technology is definitely getting there, but it's, it's, um, it's, you know, again, kind of coordinating, deciding on outcomes um, and uh, deciding how we want to use all of it. You, know? you use some great examples. Uh, I, I, we actually have a client at S3 Connected Health that is, we're gathering eight gigabytes of data a day from the implanted brain electrodes for epilepsy, for exactly what you talked about, um, and, and monitoring the brain patterns, getting multiple channels and looking at and, and doing predictive work. So that, that, that's the high end. Eight gigs of data a day is a lot of data to be sucking in and doing stuff with. That's at the high end. On the low end, as you point out, in many cases, even these fall detection systems give you false positives and false things. And if you can't figure out a fall, it's a bit challenging to figure out whether you're, you're, you're just you know, having an, an epileptic episode or not. So the extremes do exist. Um, the excitement is it's, it's, it's there and we can do a lot with it and giving you guys the information to do the predictive, that, that's what we live and work for. So it's happening, but it is slow and it is fragmented. Um, anyway. There, there's a question about a research design too, and that there was a number of, you know, potentially tools that might be available for researchers to look at various parameters of things and, and how one might uh, combine that data. And so, and I'm actually going to extend this a little bit because I mean, we, we have patients we put on clinical trials, for instance, there's a new intervention and we think it may make them, you know, better. But I mean, historically, we've said, okay, we're going to look at this as the primary outcome, and 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 that's where all your money is. If you achieve whatever you want and whatever particular parameter, that's going to be uh, what you need to move forward. For instance, <clears throat> but the development of potentially composite endpoints where you can pull data from, you know, various different parameters, integrate them, and show that you've actually made a difference in somebody's life is more problematic. And so Bill, you were kind of talking about big data before and how one might, you know, do this kind of thing because it's, uh, you know, the biased statistics of this are, are certainly beyond me, but, but I'm sure there are people out there that are working on these types of things. Uh, they are. And, and that's where I believe there's true power. If I can take an ECG and correlate it to my pulse ox and coordinate, correlate it to my motion, and I can start to pull even the, the half, five or six vital signs together and look at it, but all that has to be time stamped so that I can correlate them. All of that has to be at a standard that's usable. I can't use a Fitbit and an Apple Watch and all of this because they all give me different results. If I wore one on each hand, I'd get different results just because they're not that accurate across those. So correlating the data in time, correlating it and putting it all together with regard to being able to trust it, that is, is, is critical. Sleep, for example, how many ways do you wanna measure sleep? You can measure activity. You can measure motion on your bed. You can measure sound by snoring. I've seen ultrasonic systems that are beaming at you. Uh, EEG, is, uh, EEG, ECG, you know, pick one. There's 10 different factors that go into telling you whether you've got a good night's sleep. Yet most companies are dealing with one little one just trying to get to that. So integration, pulling the information together, time stamping it and making it relevant. It's all doable, but today you're trying to put together bits and pieces from here, there, and everywhere, and, and it's hard to do. Yeah. <clears throat> so there was a, a comment about uh, a citizen that, uh, that her daughter was enrolled and, and that helps with um, pulling together all the, all the records and imaging and whatnot. And um, so I don't know if anybody knows anything about that. I, I don't have any experience in, in that. And Stephanie, have you heard about that or anybody else on the panel? I, Stephanie, I'm you're not... muted there. I have heard of Citizen, and there's another organization similar to that uh, called All Stripes. 
And it's another uh, data conglomeration per patient. And what they're doing is collecting patient data, de-identifying it, and then trying to categorize it back out for research use. Um, but through that, they have an app associated for each patient where you can access your files all the way up to um, radiology reports and pictures and you can send them as attachments uh, via your email to your physicians. Um, again, it's just depending on the recipient on how, you know, you know, the officialness and, you know, there's all kinds of questions about it, but it is a great resource to have these um, very boutique companies out there putting together this resource, mainly for research purposes, because what they are trying to do is um, get the data into a conglomeration and then start pulling it out. But the hard part for rare disease patients, especially those who aren't necessarily completely diagnosed, is what bucket do they get put in? You know, are they put in an epilepsy bucket or are they really a TK2D patient? You know, so it's like, what, where do they go? Um, so that's, but at least I'm thankful somebody's looking at it and trying to figure it out. So this is, it sounds like this is more of a registry than a, a clinical tool. Um, it's a hybrid registry. Let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah. I've seen a number of these that pop up that are, allow you to take as a patient to take care of your record. So in essence, it's not a research tool from that perspective. It's an archival location. If you can somehow get all your information into it, it's there and it's yours. I've seen a number of those. I'm not familiar with Citizen, but there's a number of those. The only challenge with that, I remember Google Health or the Health Vault and Microsoft had one and you could upload your records and then they go away because they're not maintainable. They can't figure out how to make money out of it. So it's kind of, I'll ask this question in a slightly different way. If you had all of your priceless pictures for your family and, and are doing that, are you going to send them up into some no-name cloud company that may or may not exist six months, nine months, 10 years from now and do that? And therein is the challenge of having a consistent model that takes 70 years of your information and puts it in one place and yep. has it in safe and reliable that can't be hacked and done. And then there isn't an answer for that yet. The, the cloud maybe is an answer, but quite honestly, I'm a, I'm, a techno, I'm a technical guy, but I'm cynical about sticking too much stuff out there because there's a lot of risk. So all these companies putting that stuff in one place, just be careful. That, that, that's all I'll say. Floppy disks, CDs, <laughs> VHS tapes. <laughs> just saying. You want an eight track tape player to go with that too? <laughs> no, I'll plug the VHS to uh, So I, I think you're, you're right. One of the things that, um, that is critical to that is sustainability and safety, as well as privacy. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm leery of just dumping my data, private data into somebody helping me out. Aren't they nice helping me out? Looking at my DNA, maybe, <laughs> no, no. Nothing behind the curtain here. Yeah. So um, I, I, it, privacy, transparency, um, sustainability are all gonna be essential elements to the record, the record of the future. Great, I think we're getting close to the end of time here. So there's, there's a question I don't wanna totally gloss over, but I don't know if we can do this justice in two minutes, but would, uh, changing our healthcare insurance models, you know, potentially make a, a difference and whether that'd be single payer or whether that would be some sort of comprehensive care specific for uh, rare diseases, for instance. And, um, you know, there's, there's got to be opportunities to make things make things better, but it might be beyond the scope of what we can kind of talk about today, I think. Um, <clears throat> So uh, there's also a question about, um, you know, validating solutions for, for startups um, and developing collaborators and partners to validate that on an academic side. So, or whether that should be a kind of a public um, and private partnering model. And so, Bill, you've probably done a fair amount of that um, in, your, in your history. Um, the validated solution for innovative partnerships and that sort of thing in yeah. the academic space. 
Yeah, one of the things that's uh, always fun is working with a startup company who has this brilliant idea, but doesn't, and, 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 and research institutions like the university uh, are a great place to start. They have these great ideas, they have a vision of what needs to be done, and on a small sample size, they look at it and say, this is great. Um, taking it beyond that and getting into the mainstream of validation, the, the V and V, verification, is it the right thing? Is it working the right way? And validation is incredibly important in medical. And that's where most small companies fall down because they don't have access to the capabilities, the facilities, the, the something you know along those lines. So if you're a brand new startup, I think we have public private partnering, mostly on the private side. If you're a startup with money, the people will find you. If you're a startup scrambling for resources and that, stay in the sheltered world of the university as long, or of a university or of your startup as long as you can. But when it is time, go move out of that university environment and go tackle the real world partnerships. The U does a good job with their Office of Technology uh, commercialization to, to move stuff out and to, to look at that. But, but it, it is a challenge. Um, right. We need more. Quite honestly, well, I appreciate that. I think we're essentially out of time, so maybe if I can just wrap things up kind of quickly, and I think Dr. Cloyd is going to come on and, and speak for a few minutes yet too. But so, and I don't necessarily want to, you know, say I'm speaking for the entire group of panelists. But after the discussion today, I think I think it's pretty clear to me that there's a lot of opportunities moving forward, and you know, COVID fortunately or unfortunately started this ball rolling and um you know there's there's a lot of opportunities i think here that will uh, potentially allow us to both better care for patients and to move research forward so it's going to require some work on a number of different levels so to enact the policy changes that we need to keep the doors open so i think we'll have to come at that uh as providers and uh those that are you know in, um doing insurance and, and the advocacy groups and and virtual and industry as well. But uh, I, I think there's real opportunity to to make headway in this. So and then uh, so Jim, I think I'm going to turn this over to you. I think uh, you're going to help us close things out. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Paul. Well, it's been a terrific uh, program and I wanna express my thanks uh, to many people. But before doing so, uh, a reminder for those of you who are interested in the uh, Rare Disease Network breakout session, uh, stay on Whova and there is a link to that session immediately following this program. I think we've all come to an appreciation that telehealth, uh, which some of us had heard about before the pandemic, now uh, surrounds us and these uh, slides here illustrate just some of the many different organizations uh, that in some way are connected to telehealth. And through that, they are connected to the rare disease community. Uh, so our planning committee 10 months ago hit on this as an important topic. And I think our keynote speakers and our panelists have done a remarkable job of highlighting some of the important advances we've made and the remaining challenges. And I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. Uh, I wanna thank also our sponsors. We could not have put this program on without your support. We appreciate it. Uh, we had many patient advocacy groups uh, participate in this program. Some included a, an exhibit table. And as we go forward in future years, we encourage all of you to exhibit so that you can share your particular uh, organization and the conditions uh, in which you are uh, advancing uh, to others in our community. Uh, I want to thank the planning committee, uh, some of whom are uh, have spoken today, but in particular, I want to raise uh, a glass figuratively to Lori Inslee. Lori is the uh, administrative assistant for the Center for Warfare and Drug Research and has been uh, the lead person in coordinating this program and then implement it, implementing it, including uh, 
uh, putting together and utilizing this new technology called HUVA, which we did not even know existed until a few months ago. So Lori, kudos to you. Our keynote speakers uh, and panelists have uh, provided us with a comprehensive picture of the many benefits, that is to say the silver linings of telehealth that we've, uh, been, we've realized uh, for the rare disease community. We've also seen some of the challenges of telehealth that must be addressed if we are to sustain and expand these benefits. And I think we've heard today that there is a high probability that uh, the resolution of those challenges will occur. We hope you will walk away from our program with an appreciation for the remarkable advances telehealth is making in improving rare disease clinical care and research and the realistic process prospects of future improvements. So to all of you, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in person for our 2022 program. Good afternoon. <laughs>